Hello everybody, thank you for tuning in. Joining me here today is one of my favorite and best lecturer, the Associate Professor in the School of Architecture and Planning at Vets University. My guest has led Vets Research Center Cubes and worked extensively in low-income housing, including in local government and non-profit sector. Her research focuses on housing policy and practice, state interventions in development, and people's lived experiences of cities. She has a doctorate from the University of Sheffield in the UK. She is a research associate of the Southern Center for Inequality Studies at VEST and a co-editor of the book Politics and Community-Based Research. She serves on the boards of the journal African Studies, International Development Planning Review, and the International Journal on Homelessness, Professor Sarah Shelton. Prof. Thank you so much for joining me and giving me this opportunity to have a discussion with you about the RDP housing provision program on provision in South Africa. How have you been holding up? Good morning and thanks very much for the invitation and, and that very nice um, introduction. Um, yes, I think like everybody, it's been a pretty stressful, uh, a very stressful 18 months actually, but a particularly stressful um, last week. Um, I'm absolutely fine, but um, I think uh, a lot of us are shaken by recent events and uh, we need to find a way to kind of refocus um, and move forward. Yeah, true, true that. Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, so uh, let's get right to it. Um, the government has initiated the RBP program since 1994 um, to tackle housing strategies in South Africa. And after 27 years, the problem, the problem still persists. As you have mentioned in one, uh, in one of your research and current research that you're doing that is focused here in South Africa and Ethiopia, that the RDP houses are poorly located. So do you think that um, the program has been fruitful or reached its full potential since it has been implemented? So I think from my own research, I am inclined to um, say that I think there have been mixed outcomes of of the RDP uh, program. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I say that is really uh, drawing on some qualitative research um, done uh, in Gauteng and reading uh, research done in, in KZN by colleagues and in, in Cape Town by others. You know, there's quite a lot of quite a lot of different kinds of research into the program. So so why do I think it's it's that the outcomes are, are mixed? Well, um, I'm really going by what people themselves say about having received an RDP house. And I think I think often um, they themselves express um, quite quite mixed uh, emotions or they talk about both positive and negative aspects. Um, so I, I'm not one of the people who who is inclined to talk um, very broadly that it's it, it hasn't succeeded, that it's failed, that um, that it's all been peripheral development because I, I don't think it has all been um, located on the periphery. I think it's a much more mixed picture. So maybe I can just mention a couple of the positives and a couple of the negatives from from my perspective, um, the way I'm sort of seeing it. So so on the positive side, um, a number of people uh, interviewed uh, in, in these diverse forms of research, not only my own, um, will talk about uh, the, the feelings of pride that they experience in, in, in receiving land, property to own. Um, uh, something of the, of their their, their own and, and quite a significant asset. Um, also, the the pride and dignity of having a house of your own for for, for people who've never had that before, and particularly in the 90s uh, and into the 2000s. You know, a lot of the beneficiaries were, were people who were living in really bad conditions um, and and hadn't ever had that kind of stability um, of, of, a, of a relatively decent place to call their own from which they were not going to get evicted. They didn't have to fear um, being kicked out by a landlord or anything like that. Um, so I think there's a lot that came with the sort of feeling of recognition that the state was seeing you, the state was seeing the bad conditions that you had been living in and was was trying to address them and 
Um, so there was pride, there was dignity, and, and uh, there, there's there are lots of interesting quotes from people about how they express that. And for example, how they, um, this was something they only ever dreamed about, and this dream has come true, uh, you know, the words like that that are, that are very um, emotional. And I think there are sort of practical, practical advantages that people talk about. So, in, you know, literally having somewhere that shelters you from the elements, that uh, where there's access to clean water and sanitation, um, and that that kind of thing. Um, then, uh, what we have seen is is people being able to use that house or that property in ways that helps them improve their life. So, for example, using it as a place to generate income from. Um, by running a business or maybe renting out rooms or something like that. And, and so in that way, it, it has played a role where it can actually, um, it, it can serve as a kind of a platform for a better life. And, the, and there are other kinds of advantages, having a place to raise a family or a place to bring family together. So that's all on the positive side. And I think there is a lot of that that's happened. Um, if I can just quickly move to the negative side. Um, or, or some of the disadvantages. So there is the very widespread criticism that often the location of these houses is not advantageous. It's not in the best place. It's not offering access to opportunity, etc. So again, I, I would say I've got a, a mixed picture about that because we have to remember all the examples that are not in the periphery of urban areas. And there are quite a few um, really important projects one can name that are that are definitely not peripheral. Um, so we have to be a bit careful about sort of too many blanket generalizations. Um, but for some people, definitely the location is very problematic and it's it's in a part of the city that doesn't have good transport infrastructure, doesn't have good e an economic base to support it, um, uh, doesn't have good facilities and amenities. And so there, in those instances, we really have to ask ourselves whether this um, free benefit from the government is really advantageous. And uh, perhaps I can just re quickly recount an anecdote. In some of the research I was doing some years ago, I was looking for people who had been given an RDP house, but who um, were no longer living in it, maybe because they'd sold it or they'd rented it to somebody or whatever. And at the time, we were hearing lots of stories from government about um, frustration. Lindy mm -hmm. Sulu was the minister at the time. And she, she is now again, and she was expressing a lot of frustration. Oh, we give people houses and then they just leave them and maybe they didn't even needed them in the first place. Maybe they were not poor and they didn't need this house. So anyway, in my research, uh, one of the people I interviewed was somebody who um, was running a small informal trader stall in the in the center of Johannesburg near Park Station, actually. And um, this person was um, sleeping next to their stall at night. Um, mm -hmm. and so it was surprising to think that this person had received an RDP house. But when I interviewed this person, he said, yes, he still has his RDP house. He has received one and, and he still has it. But it's in the very far south of Johannesburg, very, very far away. Uh, in, in fact, it was over over the, in the neighboring municipality in, in, in Fuleni. And it's too far away for him to, um, to, to commute to his small business that he has in the center of Johannesburg. And it's too expensive to commute on a daily basis because he, he he's, earns a very marginal income. And so that house is not really helping him um, a, as a place for the family to live. In fact, it was empty and it was only at certain times of the month that the family would go there and check it out. In the meantime, the kids were living somewhere else with a granny close to a school. Mm. So that house was sort of locked and empty, but somehow he was still holding onto the idea and the hope that in the future, maybe it would be a place where they could all live together. So mm. I'll, I'll stop there. There are lots of other disadvantages, like the poor quality of the housing, not all of it, but some of it and various other things. But but just to give you a bit, my sense is it's a very mixed picture. And, and the work that we need to do to understand it is really to, to look a bit more carefully at the different kinds of projects, the different kinds of localities, the different kinds of advantages and disadvantages. So we kind of get a more nuanced understanding of, of what this program has, has actually done in people's lives. Sure. I totally agree with you, Prof, because in the rural areas where I come from, you find out that um, um, the government has provided someone with RDP housing, but it doesn't have services. 
doesn't have electricity, it doesn't have water, and the materials that have been used to, for that housing for that house is not uh, adequate and efficient enough. And we found out that it's too small for a family of eight to stay in that kind of housing. So there's been some sort of challenges back at home. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, and I realized that some of the houses um, have been and still are are being illegally issued, right? And there is nepotism, corruption, and maladministration. So what does this tell us about the South African government and governance? Yeah, well, both of those things that you've mentioned, the example that you gave from your from a, a rural area about the, the infrastructure not being in place to kind of support the house mm. uh, and and the issue of allocations, those both both point to issues of governance um, for me. Um, on the first one, the issue of the infrastructure, uh, you know, in, in the 90s, we were also finding many projects uh, in KZN where I was working at the time in Etiquini. Um, uh, uh, I was working in Etiquini. The, the projects weren't so much in Etiquini, but across the across the country, we were hearing about these projects where the houses were being delivered, but the infrastructure wasn't there, and that really spoke to a lack of coordination across different departments, uh, across different spheres of government. That maybe national was allocating housing funds to the provincial human settle department or housing department, and they were going ahead. Uh, um, engaging with developers, contractors, finding land, going ahead and building a project, but they were building the houses and they weren't interacting with the local authority mm. that that needed to, um, you know, approve the, the infrastructure, the layout. And, and that was a real disconnection and, and, and between spheres of government. Um, and we see it. We've, we see examples of where Gauteng province, for example, has, has gone ahead with projects that the city of Johannesburg may not have approved and it may not have fitted into the spatial um, priorities of the city of Joburg. So, so that's a, a real problem that hopefully we've got better at over the years in the housing sector about how to do this coordination. Um, but it seems it seems like a really obvious thing that we should have got right very early. Uh, um, and it's interesting that in rural areas, you know, one would have to understand the different institutions, the different responsibilities for infrastructure versus housing and how that comes about, that mm. disconnect that you, you're talking about. On the allocation side, that's hugely problematic. And I think we've got ourselves into a very complicated set of systems around allocations. Um, you know, the idea of the waiting list that, that has become a, quite a powerful sort of symbol. And then we hear stories of people having been on the waiting list for 20, 20 years, 25 years, still haven't received their turn because others are getting it before then. Um, I suppose if we step back from the, 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 the bit of a mess that is the allocation system at the moment, uh, even though there have been attempts to improve it with the, the demand management system and these new systems that have been introduced, there have been attempts to improve it. If we step back from that, we, we, we can sort of appreciate that an allocation system is a pretty complicated thing to, to try and work with um, because of, of, of the problem that one sometimes has kind of crisis situations that demand some kind of prioritization, um, but then that's seen as queue jumping, you know, so for example, you know, an, an, an informal settlement on the banks of, of Alex and uh, on the banks of the Yuxke in Alex, that then if the Yuxke floods, uh, that might be seen as a priority area and, and people need to be allocated in advance of other people. But it's seen as queue jumping, um, and there have been all these complications. People living in backyards feeling very um, frustrated that people in informal settlements get some kind of prioritisation, or have, mm -hmm. you know, there have been particular examples where those have been prioritised. When I was working in Durban, there was an interesting example. I found it interesting, and an interesting um, small allocation that we did in one of our. Uh, Greenfields projects where a lot of the project was earmarked for a particular informal settlement where, where there had been a, a landslide and people were had to be moved in, in an emergency situation to a transit camp and then got allocated this housing. But there was also some particular kind of housing we did on one edge of the project and that we advertised generally. We sort of, um, we, we, we advertised to anyone that would like to apply for that. It was housing that we had um, uh, we'd added a bit more than the standard RDP into it. We'd done a veranda and various things, and so we asked for a cash contribution to cover that. So there was I think five thousand rand, um, and then you know people had to apply, and of course we got far too many people applying for 
uh, the number of houses. Uh, so we did a sort of lottery system that was overseen by the councillors, um, that, that people had to, all the names and all the applications, of course, were vetted to make sure they complied, you know, that was all the criteria of government. But then all of those bits of paper, we did a physical paper thing, were, were put in a big box and, and everybody stood around, not all the applicants, but all the officials and the councillors and things. And then they were they were just randomly chosen, you know, not even looking, but just pulling out bits of paper. And and you know some people were lucky and 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 received the house and some people were unlucky but everyone kind of accepted that it was sort of a that it was the luck of the draw literally um, you know provided you qualified your name went into the box and you may have been lucky and in some ways those kinds of systems which actually are quite transparent um, you know but they do respond to people um, expressing an interest in a particular locality or a particular project. Uh, rather than maybe assigning someone a unit that may be very far from where their their schooling is or their their, their, their job is, that those kinds of systems are things that perhaps we could have explored more and 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 tried out those, experimented with them a bit more. Yeah, true, true. Um, do you think that um, the provision of RDP housing is a need, um, or the government can rather just focus on something else such as education um, and other things? Do you think that RDP housing is in need in South Africa? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Certainly, uh, with the with the new democratic government in ninety four, it it was politically a very important thing um, to 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 work with. And, you know, and that went back to all the political promises going back to the Freedom Charter uh, and the fact that in the in the nineteen eighties, as part of making the government the the country ungovernable. Um, uh, housing had become a real flashpoint politically uh, and also it was then symbolically very important uh, as well as practically very important for the state to recognize that people had had uh, really terrible living conditions, very few rights to urban areas, um, that there was a massive problem with land distribution. Um, so so it's, it, 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 I think it makes sense to me that it was prioritised in the 90s as a, as a key programme for, for the state um, and, and, and part of, being, of giving people ownership of land was part of this land distribution story. Um, you know, if we look at it now from a 2021 perspective and if the question is should we be carrying on with it, uh, then, then maybe there, there are other things that come into play. You know, if you if you now unpack what lies behind somebody's very poor living conditions now, so somebody that might be living in an informal settlement or um, or, or or be homeless and living in a park, or, or many many kinds of conditions that we could name, if you look at what lies behind that, um, probably we'd very quickly um, once we sort of unpack layers, we'd very quickly get to the issue of poverty or not having sufficient means to kind of find a decent place or to participate in in the market sort of um the housing market whether it's rental or purchase or whatever and so one one might build up an argument that one should be intervening in the poverty situation of people in order that they can house themselves rather than intervening in the housing situation mm -hmm. um and Maybe there are many ways we should be intervening in the poverty situation, although as a country we seem very stuck on that issue. We've got this massive unemployment, massive youth unemployment, the demographics of unemployment are, are, are very skewed towards black people, are, are, are the ones who are experiencing the majority of unemployment, and we seem to, unable to 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 grow the economy in such a way that we produce jobs but you know maybe there would be other other ways to to work on this issue some people might argue that we should be going for a universal income grant um, and channeling some of the the money that's going into other programs like housing into that sort of thing so i think there are big debates to be had around this about whether where one should be trying to intervene in difficult lives um, Having said that, the the urban land redistribution program, uh, you know, there's, there's there's huge amounts of work still to be done there, and there there hasn't been sufficient land redistribution. So should we be trying to do that through a housing program, um, literally trying to trying to give land to people in in well located parts of the city, uh, or should we be looking at that aspect differently as well? Um, you know, is it rather about people having a stake in companies? Uh, in in other 
parts of the economy mm. through shares or, or other means? Uh, should we be focusing on providing access to opportunity, which doesn't have to be through land ownership? It could be um, subsidised rental in, in, you know, in Santon, in the heart of Santon. So people have got access to all sorts of things, but that block of flats could be held by government into the future for, for uh, at, at a subsidised rental, but but it's not actually transferring the ownership of the individual flat to people. So the the big debates I think around how does housing fit into the whole story about where is best to intervene um, uh, in in a kind of complex situation of poverty, but also uh, inequality in asset ownership in yeah. the country. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's true, that's true. So um, one last question, and this might be off, <laughs> but I'm just going to ask it anyway. <laughs> so um, how long do you think that the government um, should continue blaming apartheid in uh, everything that has, is happening right now in, in the country, like special and, and, and racial segregation, unemployment rate, and everything else? How long do you think that they should or, or they should they should keep on blaming apartheid, or they should stop blaming that and say, you know what, this has happened, and then we learn from the past and try to find a viable solution in for the future as in now. But rather they be like, ah, oh, because of apartheid, this and this happened, and yeah, and then there, there is no solution to that. How long do you think they should keep on doing that? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um... Because apartheid did uh, literally inscribe in concrete <laughs> many things, you know, mm -hmm. including in, in our cities. So those of us in the in the built environment sector are having to deal with the consequences of apartheid still. Um, so so there is a lot to to, to 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 deal with that that apartheid legacy. And then, you know, of course, of course. Economically, the apartheid legacy has been incredibly strong, mm. but we, we're also in a situation where um, I suppose that the ANC government came to power at a time when other forms of sort of political and economic systems were uh, were, were were not providing uh, um, strong models. Um, so I'm referring to the sort of collapse of communism and. Um, some aspects of sort of socialist economies that were happening in the late 80s, mm -hmm. um, uh, early 90s, you know, more or less at the same time as the NC government was coming to power. So so what we ended up doing uh, from an economic perspective is going this, um, um, I suppose one can, I, I don't like the word neoliberal because I think it's too um, too vague. It doesn't help us really understand what's going on. But, but you know, we have gone very much for a system that that does um, have to uh, talk to, buy into, speak to the the circuits of global capital. Uh, the whole world is in this situation where um, globalization is 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 how we understand things work. Um, capitalism, and there are very few examples in the world that are doing anything differently from which we, we can learn. So, so I suppose our transition to democracy, you know, coincided with the fact that those other alternatives that might have offered a different economic path for us weren't really on the table. They had fallen away by by then. And so, uh, I'm really, where I'm, I'm going with this point is that, you know, a lot of our problems now, I think, are also related to this complex economic system that the whole world is following of, of, of global capitalism basically and um, and so although that's not directly uh, only a consequence of apartheid it's also just to do with the the context of the last you know 30 years has has kind of been that way and it's unfortunate that we, we've we've got so entangled with that that we're also in this really difficult economic situation that has the, the layers of apartheid underneath it, but also these other layers um, of the sort of con contemporary economics of the world on top of it, and and those are very difficult. That's that's a very difficult combination to try and deal with. Okay, uh, Prof, I think that now the government should. I think it's time for the government to look at itself in the mirror and say that you are the problem in the society. And <laughs> what is it that I that I can do to um, to do better and change um, the society? So I think it's time for the government to just look at itself in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm the problem. And then what is it that I can do to change for the better? So I. 
Yes, no, well, I, I think I would agree with you there. There is so much that we are, um, we have been aware of, but are even more aware of now about what's gone wrong and, and what government has done in a, in a very problematic way. I mean, I'm thinking of things that are coming out, coming out of the State Capture Commission. Mm. It's just revealing the extent of, of, of problems and, and real dysfunction in things that we really should have got right. And, and also cynical um, self-interest. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I come from an era where I had thought that what we were trying to do was were the kinds of things encapsulated in the RDP document, the Reconstruction and Development Program document, which was a whole social and economic plan for reconstruction. And it was all about lifting poor people out of poverty and creating a more equal society. Those were, the, you know, those were the kind of golden aspirations of of the 90s in the honeymoon phase of transition. And uh, and and so much of that, you know, has proved subsequently just so many of us were proved to be just very naive not to have seen what other what other action was going on in the state. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's it is actually very depressing to kind of think of where where we've where we've landed up after all these years of opportunity. Nevertheless, there are some really good people within the state, and we have to try and hope. <laughs> I'm thinking of particular officials who've just done amazing work despite all odds. We have to try and yeah. hope that we can pull ourselves out of this crisis. <laughs> Nobila would say that in one of the classes uh, the other day. She said that uh, what if the government try and you know deal with these issues. Uh, simultaneously rather than dealing with them in increments <laughs> what, do you, what, what would you say to that oh you're talking about different kinds of problems yeah, yeah, like just... housing um, uh, infrastructure jobs whatever that is facing south africa at the moment what if they try and fix everything all at once rather than just saying you know what for this period of five years we're going to look at housing for this period of seven years we're going to do this and do because once you do and uh, you, you look into housing now for five years after five years when you try and say look okay let me look at um uh trying and create employment for people and then there is something's gonna something's gonna take you back to housing that is yeah so so how about if they try and do these things simultaneously all at once yeah i think that i think that would be absolutely ideal i think the problem is that the requirement uh to do that is a capable state Okay. And I think uh, we've got a long way to go. There, there, there's there's so much to fix in the state itself. We've got very bloated bureaucracies at the moment. We've got mm -hmm. things that aren't functioning very well in the state. Um, and so, yeah, there's, uh, the question is, can we fix aspects of the state, the state's relationship with society at the same time as trying to actually do this more holistic form of delivery, mm. which, which would be ideal. Um, but all of that is quite a big ask <laughs> to, to be able to do that. So um, I'm perhaps a bit less hopeful that we're able to do it. Uh, but but I do think it's the right thing to do, to be tackling things on many, many fronts. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, this is the end of our conversation. Thank you, Prof, for joining me. I really, 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 really appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure, and thank you for those interesting and stimulating questions. <laughs> thank you so much. Have yourself a great day ahead, and take care, please. We still thank need you. <laughs> thank you, and you too. Bye. -bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.